thank you all for attending today. Um, we really appreciate you taking your time um, to come to our PI Academy event. I know it looks a little different than what we normally have it, but we were also able to open it up um, to a lot more um, individuals. So I'm very excited about that. Um, one of the things I just wanted to highlight um, as part of the PI Academy, um, if you are a principal investigator with us and you register, um, you do have access to our sole site um, and we have some videos on there, some articles, um, just different aspects of adding um, more education for you. Um, and with that, we do have a total of eight items within that syllabus um, that are required um, in order to receive a certificate. Um, one of those is a new city module that we actually purchased for the PI Academy. It's called Biomedical PI. And we actually had two individuals that we wanted to recognize um, for actually obtaining their certificate. Um, the first person is Dr. Amir Cameron. Um, he is assistant professor with the School of Medicine. He got his certificate in November. And Dr. Constance Weiner, she received hers on December of 2019. Um, she's an associate professor with the School of Dentistry. So I just wanted to thank you both um, for your dedication um, in order to get that certificate, because I know it, it took some time. Um, so I really appreciate you doing that. Um, for anyone that may have questions about where you might be in obtaining your certificate, um, feel free to reach out to me, um, debbie.lee at hscwvu.edu. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. So today we've got a presentation from Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford is a general internist and the David Levine Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins with joint appointments in the School of Public Health and Nursing. For the past 15 years, he has been the Vice Dean for Clinical Investigation for Johns Hopkins of Medicine and Director of the CTSA Funded Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. Dr. Ford is also the PI for PCORN Net Clinical Data Research Network funded by PCORI. He's the institutional official for the Johns Hopkins Medicine IRB, oversees clinical trial contacting, clinical research billing, investigational drug service, and IT support for clinical research. His primary research included the interrelationship between depression and coronary artery disease, as well as using informatics to improve outcomes for patients with mental disorders cared for in primary care. More recently, has been a leader in developing and evaluating new approaches for enhancing the efficacy and impact of translational research. So we're very grateful to have you presenting to us this afternoon. Um, and with that, I'll give it over to you, Dr. Ford. Well, thank you, Megan. Uh, can everybody see me and, and see the slides? I'm assuming that's a yes. Well, when I was uh, asked to, to present a few months ago, I was assuming it would be, you know, a nice summer spring day in, in Morgantown. And we have a place in Deep Creek, so I, I like going there and, you know, thinking about uh, going to Purple Fiddle, Seneca Rocks, all the things that are fun around Morgantown. Um, but um, it's, it's a little bit different. So with that, I'm still happy to, to be able to talk to you versus, the, um, versus this webinar. So I'm gonna, again, talk to you mostly about clinicaltrials.gov registration and reporting. And, um, you know, it continues to be an important uh, issue both for research leaders, um, for Francis Collins and others. So, so let me just move through. First, tell you I have no disclosures that are really important to this. I certainly talked to some software firms that are trying to improve how universities can do their registration reporting, but uh, I, I have no specific relationships with them, nor do I endorse any of their products. So this is what I'm gonna to try to cover today, a little bit again to refresh us on the rationale and current regulations around clinicaltrials.gov the current performance in meeting the regulations from, uh, from uh, academic uh, universities, um, how Hopkins developed a program to meet the obligations for clinicaltrials.gov, and then I'll just briefly show you the results of a survey of how other CTSA institutions are developing their programs. So let's just go through the rationale for clinical trials registration, and then we'll talk about um, the reporting side. So on registration, 
you know, you can see the group that benefits on the, on the right and the registry purpose. So fulfill ethical obligations to actually learn something from uh, an other in the field of science to learn something when, when individuals participate in research. And that remains the, the number one obligation. Provide information to potential participants and referring clinicians. And this is really that idea that you can go to clinical trials and look up what are relevant trials for you and where they are located. Um, I think all of us know that clinicaltrials.gov is not a perfect website for that function and patients would have a hard time um, navigating it. On the other hand, it does remain the only really comprehensive database of current clinical trials. So people take that data and oftentimes refashion it in a way that would make it easier for patients and clinicians to find relevant trials. Um, you know, the need to reduce publication bias. And I think we, we, we still um, see that there are unreported, um, clinical trials, and we can talk a little bit about this in terms of pilot studies and others um, that, you know, make us go back to the original reason for a clinicaltrials.gov was to reduce publication bias. And if you see some of the analyses, we, we probably are making pretty good progress in clinical trials, but on the observational data, there remains, um, you know, huge publication bias that uh, um, I, I think is is quite evident where you see in publications so many um, uh, survey results are clustered around like a p-value of 0 0.03, 0 0.04 uh, that we know are, are highly unlikely if everybody was looking at all of the observational data. Um, help editors and others understand the context of study results that they can more easily find out what are those relevant trials in um, in a particular area. Uh, even for our IRB, I've thought, and, and we're starting to do this actually with COVID research because it's really sort of changed the landscape on that, that when, uh, when a PI is making an application for, uh, to the IRB about getting an approval of a protocol, they have to include some description about what they found when they went to clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, promote more efficient allocation of research funds. Um, you know, why would we, uh, why would someone fund the third exact trial um, when two other trials are close to reporting results? Uh, the IRB is determining appropriateness of a research study. Um, you know, we, we kind of um, just uh, cavalierly put in a consent form that says, well, what are the alternatives to participation? And it says, you know, not participating in any research um, and continuing with clinical care. When the reality is their alternatives are maybe participating in another clinical trial that really would be more appropriate to, to that individual. On the results side, um, again, provide a public record of basic study results in a standardized format. And that's helpful for um, researchers, journal editors, anybody that's trying to synthesize the, um, the, the medical literature, promote fulfilling of the ethical responsibility to participants that research results contribute to medical knowledge. And I know some people say like, well, why do pilot studies really have to go into clinicaltrials.gov? Um, and, you know, I can tell you, in fact, the consent form for the pilot studies or what a high risk pilot study is one of the most difficult consent forms to do because you're essentially telling a participant you're going to take risks. Um, the benefits will only occur if the pilot studies are looked at and if they're positive, someone is going to go ahead and do the full study. Um, so I think even on, on the um, pilot study side, it's important. And there continues to be real gaps in the reporting. Um, and, and I can just give you one, you know, personal example, which still, um, you know, bothers me is uh, in January of 2018, we had a child 
die in a phase one trial. And it was for a, a new drug for muscular dystrophy. Um, as best we can tell, the protocol was followed exactly. This um, child had actually toxic levels of the proposed drug. Um, this was not a, this was a study where Hopkins was participating as a site, but was not a sponsor of the site. And to this day, that result and that adverse event or that death as a sentinel event is still not reported on clinicaltrials.gov. And in fact, it's a drug that was, it's a repurposed drug. It's not in the literature. It's not in clinicaltrials.gov. The only way, I mean, it's all over the internet. So participants in, the, in that community would know, but a researcher that was trying to look at this uh, and an anti-fibrosing agent really would not learn about this until the FDA looked at their IND. And that's why we go back and say, you know, well, why, is, why do we need to ask the FDA to approve INDs? And sometimes it's because they still are the only group that really has the complete list of the adverse events uh, or the safety record associated with the drug. Um, and again, mitigating publication and outcome reporting biases. This is even, you know, at the result side, which is certainly important for users of medical literature and facilitating systematic reviews and other analyses of the research literature. In fact, the researchers that do meta-analyses are the ones that are often the the most, um, have the most scrutiny of clinicaltrials.gov in terms of its completeness and the data that's available for them to do their meta-analyses. And this is what, uh, you know, a comment that I think summarizes what we all think, that when you do a clinical study and you're asking patients to participate and subject themselves to risk, in order to inform science and generate knowledge, you have an ethical obligation to disseminate those results to the wider scientific community. And that includes, as I said, pilot studies. Oftentimes pilot studies, after a few patients, you might see a safety signal that says, um, you know, we're, we're not gonna continue down this line. And those may be some of the most important results that the wider scientific community has to understand. We'll go a little bit, I mean, if you look and, you know, it's not surprising that the performance of universities in terms of their um, ability, their, their completeness of the records, that it's still, you know, there's maybe as much as a third that are um, not reported or not reported on time. Um, and, you know, Francis Collins and the NIH is very interested in this. It is very hard to go to Congress and ask for more money. And the congressmen say, but a third of the time, the studies you fund never either, you know, be, are published or, uh, you know, included in clinicaltrials.gov. So right before the COVID epidemic started, um, we were talking with Francis Collins and, and the NCASH group saying, okay, what are we going to do to finally solve this problem? So there isn't another article that comes out that says that universities are, are not reporting uh, appropriately in clinicaltrials.gov. And it actually has quite a long history of increasing regulations uh, around clinicaltrials.gov. As you can see, um, it started really in, in 1997, around 2000, the NIH releases the clinicaltrials.gov website. Um, and, you know, the, the journal editors require registration around 2005, and you can see there's um, increasing numbers of organizations that are, are saying you have to, you have to support even, even CMS for the clinical trial number on claims. So if you're doing research billing and you want CMS to pay for the usual care portion of a clinical trial, you're obligated to include the clinical trial number on the claims for, for CMS to, um, to fund. And I think you see at the, uh, you know, 
the NIH has uh, really started to get, um, you know, serious about improving the reporting in the last couple of years. We'll show you that. And they're now keep extending what they expect. So in 2019, the new rule now is requiring informed consent being uploaded as well. So if you, um, you know, regulatory bodies that uh, the FDA uh, really started, which we, you know, for the, the FUDA or FDAAA responsible party, um, and you will see must be report, uh, no later than um, one year after the primary completion date. So for those of you that are thinking about reporting of results, that means one year after the last assessment of the primary outcome. And I know I have some faculty members myself that'll say, well, you know, that's, that's actually a short period of time in terms of doing the analysis. And, um, um, you know, I can't put it in clinicaltrials.gov because I can't get it, the journals won't accept that. And that is entirely wrong. The journals have all said, that report putting results in clinicaltrials.gov does not prevent anybody from then publishing the data. Um, and that monetary penalty, I think it's up to, oh, 12,800 a day. And I think I'll show you later. There are several trackers that talks about how, you know, the FDA could have collected, uh, you know, a huge amount of money right now if they were actually enforcing it. Um, but that is a, um, a, a penalty that you can see gets the attention of a university compliance office in terms of whether it actually would be um, enforced. And, and for the most part, the FDA is still not enforcing it. Um, it may have changed now, but about a year ago, I think we were the only university that I'm aware of that actually was given 30 days to, um, to update a record or else. They didn't really say fine, um, but just to kind of show you that when you have compliance um, regulations, you never know who's gonna use those compliance regulations to make a point. Um, so I think it's highly unlikely that this was a random event, that the study that we got called on was a study funded by a foundation, which was a randomized clinical trial about two different ways to reduce pain for women that are undergoing abortion. Um, so while I could not get the exact word from the FDA, clearly there was a political group that was trying to make sure that every study um, met all the regulatory guidelines. So we, and they had actually, this group had been quite good about keeping up with their records, had, had actually uploaded the paper, but had not formalized all the results. But nonetheless, this is a huge find that, that uh, um, could, could be millions if, the, if it ever gets enforced. Then the second one is with the NIH where I do, uh, I can tell you based on the task force that the NIH is beginning to enforce this. And so you're having PIs that are, their notice of grant award for a clinical trial is being held up if their, um, if their records are not updated for previous clinical trials that have been funded. For the most part, it seems to just be related to a specific PI's performance. Um, if it generalizes to the university's performance, I think um, you will see a lot more peer pressure to keep the, um, the re registration and results um, on track because I don't think any faculty member really wants to cost uh, be the reason for why their peer did not get funded for, for an NIH clinical trial. Then we have the, the, the journal editors, and I'll just tell you a little bit more about that. We mentioned CMS, and then um, recently as well, all the foundations, all, all the big foundations, particularly the international foundations, also signed on to requirement of uh, 
of registration and results reporting for anybody that receives a grant. Um, if people don't think the journals are serious about this, they are mistaken. Um, and uh, this is uh, what can come back to a uh, faculty member who um, submits their clinical trial results to some of the largest journals. And this is a, I mean, it's really a tragedy that somebody who had spent years of their lives might not be in a position to get it published in the best journals because they didn't publish this correctly. Now, let me just expand on this a little bit. Um, there's a couple things about this. First of all, if you, if you just didn't actually register it, um, you're in trouble. I, I will say I have tried and was successful one time, you know, getting a faculty member's um, manuscript to be reviewed because we talked about some of the conditions that led to the problem. But another one to be very, very aware of is sometimes study teams are a little, um, again, I would say careless or not as rigorous as they should be when they put in what is the primary outcome for their trial. And when you put that in, you will be held to that standard when you submit the manuscript. And there's, again, one of the things we know at the NIH is they don't all act the same. The institutes have their own unique way of doing this. And at, at least right now, I know the NIMH, you cannot get your grant approved until you have your clinical trials number documented. Now, we don't really like that. We would prefer it occurs after the IRB, after the protocol has really been finalized. Because what happens is, you know, not a big surprise to you, but the, the faculty members will put down anything in clinicaltrials.gov to get their funding started. And they need to remember, they can change it up until the point that they study starts, they start enrolling people. But don't put in what is not really the, the primary outcome for your trial and forget to go back and correct it because you can correct it, but you will be held to that. And again, um, you know, a faculty member that works in the pain area um, was put in this situation where it wasn't exactly the outcome as he had registered in clinicaltrials.gov. And it was um, a very painful uh, several months in terms of trying to get a journal to review that article. On the other hand, while I was sympathetic with this person, you can imagine when it comes to pain, there are so many different ways you can measure that and count as your outcome. A 25% reduction, a 50% reduction, a you know continuous scale, different assessments of pain that you can understand why we do as a scientific field have to be pretty strict about saying, you know, how are you gonna analyze the data before you get started? Because the, the opportunity of picking another outcome uh, in pain would be quite easy. Um, again, a little bit of these, and, and I'm not, you, you'll have a copy of this because these are pretty detailed slides, but you'll understand it, um, that if you, and there's gonna be somewhat different standards for the groups, generally you need to always, well, you should do the registration before you enroll your first participant, but certainly within the first 21 days. And if you do it within the first 21 days, you'll generally be okay. You have to verify and, and keep the record updated if there's a change in your process. Um, you know, when recruitment stops, so when people, you know, are making the point that, universities aren't up to date on clinicaltrials.gov. Part of it is on the updating um, component. Um, and then reminding you that you have a full 365 days from primary completion date. That goes by really quickly, 365 days. And, and we can tell you a little bit, I think I'll show you later that there's always going a little bit of be a a little bit of back and forth between clinicaltrials.gov except uh, uh, in terms of the acceptability of the data. So 
our Hopkins data could say it might take as long as two months of back and forth before they actually, clinicaltrials.gov actually accepts your, um, uh, your results and that, you know, moves into that one year as well. And then remember, it's increasing. So now you're going to submit full protocol, the statistical plan, and you're a copy of the consent form. Um, just uh, reminding you, you can look through this, applicable clinical trials per FDA are quite focused, but if you look at the end, pretty much if it has anything to do with the United States, um, you're going to be required to report it, even you know, manufactured in the US, even if all the sites are international. This is the, um, again, the, the NIH report, you can um, look at this as well. It's important to note it does include behavioral interventions. So the NIH doesn't care whether it's a drug or a device like the FDA does. The NIH is saying any intervention is considered a clinical trial and you must do the appropriate reporting. Um, before I, I, you know, I did the talk, I tried to look a little bit on West Virginia, and I see um, that you do have quite a few behavioral studies that are, um, you know, from outside the School of Medicine and others, and um, those, those do have to be um, reported if they're NIH funded or you're asking for NIH funds. And um, you, if you haven't been totally involved in this, this NIH definition of a clinical trial has been um, somewhat contentious over the last couple years because, again, uh, we were used to thinking of clinical trials as a randomized clinical trial. The NIH noticed, a, going back to this issue about pilot studies, or you see at the bottom mechanistic studies. So. Uh, there in the NIH definition, if you're doing a clinical trial looking at uh, giving everybody metformin to see what impact it has on insulin sensitivity, that is a clinical trial. And, you know, the, the, the early translational scientists were, you know, quite upset about this and they talked about how their protocols change and evolve and I I actually am somewhat sympathetic to them, but the NIH is not going to change their view. So eventually we're going to have a whole nother group that are learning. And there's a website that the NIH gives like 36 different examples for you to try to figure it out. Like is it is an MRI an intervention? No, an MRI is an intervention. It's a functional MRI an intervention. Yes, a functional MRI is an intervention. It has to be registered. So there's a lot of um, a lot of nuance in there, but it does mean that people have to look at it. And for those of us that run these programs, I'm actually quite concerned about this because if you take the standard therapeutic clinical trial that lasts, you know, three, you know, three, four, five years, you actually don't have to engage that much with a clinical trial. Now, if you're an early translational investigator who does trials that have, you know, three, five, 10 people, and you're moving it through in terms of a grant, you may have to do a lot more interaction with clinical trials than the usual because you've got more trials starting and ending and results reporting. Um, again, we've talked a little bit about the legal consequences of non-compliance. Um, you know, this is the, the, the rate has gone up per study. Um, and mentioning again that Francis Collins was very clear that they have the, they can withhold clinical trial funding to grant the institutions if they do not verify registration and results reporting. I don't think that's going to change. I think that's frankly going to go up because again, Francis Collins and the NIH group is, is a little upset that academic institutions haven't improved more in this area. Um, and we do talk about this get out of jail free, which is um, somewhat possible that you can use this at times if you have a good office to do that. I did notice on the West Virginia clinicaltrials.gov that you have a lot of old studies that have not been finalized and anybody that's 
the university that's gone into the cleanup phase. Those are the toughest ones to work with, but you need to clean those up because they just keep staying there and continue to, to hurt your, uh, your compliance record. Um, talking again about uploading of the informed consent, which is um, going to come, uh, you know, is actually starting now, should be uploaded no later than 60 days after the last study visit. Um, for those of you that are in these clinical trials, you often know that we go through many amendments and it's not one clinical trial, it's not one informed consent, it's, um, it's several. And actually, if you look, all they say is the consent form must have been used in enrolling participants. So whatever you post, it has to have been used. You don't have to post all five versions of the, uh, of the informed consent document. Um, and again, you can, you can look through the summary of requirements. Again, the VA, you know, a little bit different than, uh, than the NIH, but, um, you know, more or less in the same general category. Um, you know, PCORI um, has, has added this now as well, although they, they still focus a lot on the abstract. Um, DOD is following the FDA as well. Now let's talk about data sharing because that's the next thing that also at the time of registration, you have to indicate your data sharing um, plan. Um, this is you know, data sharing at the individual participant level. Um, and I do believe that that has um, you know, some challenges still that we're still trying to figure out. There are, uh, but, but if you look, most participants in clinical trials understand the value of the sharing of data. And if you ask patient groups um, or foundations that fund these, they have very little tolerance for, for suggestions that, you know, academics um, need to get the best publications to be, to be promoted and you have to recognize the individual value of, of the participants. That's just not what they're generally thinking about. They're, they're thinking about how to move the, you know, the ball as fast as you can on, on new treatments. And here you can see for the most part, I mean, I do think you have to, um, as we say, this is, um, you know, the United States and, and what do we do with those 8% of people that don't want to be shared and their data shared. And on clinical trial data, I personally, and even the European groups have backed down a little bit on, on the sharing of clinical trial data at the individual level for, for studies involving children, where you know, many of those children with rare conditions, it actually is quite identifiable. There are certain websites that are coming up that are trying to help you make, you know, Vivly is one that I'm on the steering committee for. We're trying, this is a international website where you can upload clinical trial data and pharma is supporting this as well. Um, the big difference is it's essentially like a data enclave. So no one downloads the data. You go into that environment to analyze the data. So the clinical trial data is not um, at the individual level is not being widely shared. Um, I'm not going to take you through this, but this is a, from one of our courtesy of Scott Patton at Stanford going through the, um, the, the obligations you have and when that should be done. But if you look about midway through there, you see, so now it's study protocol, statistical analysis plan, informed consent form, the, the clinical study report, and the analytic code is where uh, we are heading in terms of being posted on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and you can see now that even the, the journal editors are getting um, in, involved in this where they're requiring data sharing statements um, as a condition for publication. Now, you can see there has been a lot of public interest in reporting of these. The, probably the BMJ and, and European journals more, um, more uh, aggressive in 
talking about how well universities are doing. Um, BMJ, I believe, I think I heard they stopped it, but they had a feature for a while where um, once a month they would highlight a study that had not reported at all on their results, either through publication or on clinicaltrials.gov as sort of an embarrassment factor. Um, and, you know, I have to say, like, one of them was a randomized clinical trial on a treatment of, uh, of cocaine abuse that had never reported any results in terms of enrolling more than 100 individuals. And they made the point, there's no, you know, we don't have any good treatment for, for cocaine abuse. And here is a clinical study that was done that has not published anything uh, or reported anything in like three or four years. So that was kind of their, their general approach on the, on the shaming aspect. Um, and, uh, you know, here's another one, clinical trials, what a waste, trials that are unregistered, unfinished, unpublished, unreachable, or simply irrelevant. This is one, there are definitely um, groups, this is Stat News, which has been putting up on a, uh, the ability to look at how well each um, uh, organization is doing using publicly available data. Again, we could all argue that sometimes they're stretching the truth in terms of um, performance. You know, we believe that it's not great. Um, but uh, the more recent, so this was another one. So this is TransPeriMed, which is a European group. And about the same time as when science came out with a article showing again that uh, um, that uh, academic institutions were behind in reporting, and that's really, you know, what got Francis Collins so upset. But I will show you, I mean, if you look, it is possible to do well on this, and people, most institutions have been doing better, and, you know, we, we're happy. I'll show you a little bit more that Johns Hopkins for this one, um, you know, was in the group that had 100% compliance. Even then, I, I have to be truthful, is the that Johns Hopkins University did not include the Cancer Center um, because they're a separate organization when it comes to clinicaltrials.gov. And um, we are almost through with cleaning up all the trials in the Cancer Center, but um, you know, it, it has been uh, you know, a, a journey for, for many um, universities. And here's an FDA tracker, trials tracker. You look at that, you see that number. If the US government had, had imposed fines, they'd have at least $5 billion. Um, and, uh, but if you see here, they're still talking around percent reported of around 68%. Still, um, you know, not really something that the scientific field uh, should, should be proud of. Um, and for results reporting, again, within the 30 days, um, we wanna say if it's applicable clinical trial, study, dart, study start date on or after January 18, 2017, the results information first submitted after January 2020. This would be what the NIH is requiring. And then you see um, they're also then talking about reporting uh, results and releasing those results independent of publication. So, you know, what, what are the, some of the challenges that we all, um, you know, have with this? Um, and I can tell you, this is why we ended up having create our own office. Well, first of all, it's high turnover among research staff, particularly research coordinators. When we first started, I mean, we, we find that we have about a 10 to 15% turnover per year for a research coordinator. So if it's a five-year trial, there's at least a 50% chance that the research coordinator that started with the trial is not there at the end. Um, exit procedures for PIs is a big deal. It's a problem when the protocol is registered to the university and we're depending on the PI to do it. And then the PI leaves the university and we cannot track them down to leverage. The, uh, and we have no leverage left with them to say, you need to finish your clinical trial stock of reporting. Um, and that's where we talk about the data stewardship, older records, um, 
competing responsibilities. I know that lack of training or statistical knowledge for some of, we, we oftentimes have to bring in a biostatistician to help the teams actually do the correct report. Um, and I have to say at the end, difficulty with the website, the clinicaltrials.gov DACA website is not good. They just did another RFI to ask for it. The, the National Library of Medicine may be ready to undertake a massive reworking of the website that would be helpful. Another possibility is that there may be, um, you know, some companies stepping in um, to create that better interface between the research team and clinicaltrials.gov. And this is what we see in pharma. So one of the reasons why pharma has better results reporting than academia is, um, you know, many of the, I mean, Pfizer, the last I heard, had eight full-time people managing clinicaltrials.gov, and they don't really have that many more trials than, than a place like Johns Hopkins. Um, and they purchase pretty expensive software systems that allow a researcher to put in one element and then it interfaces to clinicaltrials.gov and the information goes directly into clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so, you know, I do think we're wondering about some technical solutions that could improve reporting. And, but they're not just the software companies. You need to, they need to interface with your IRB or your clinical trial management system or some way you have to know when that team has, has completed recruitment to really make it worthwhile. And so, you know, what, what are those meeting the challenges? I believe you do need somebody that, um, uh, that, you know, acts as that point person really understands the detail can help teams um, because it's still, you know, in some ways more technical than it should be. Um, the website is not great. I have to say, I, I think we have been, you know, when I say Johns Hopkins, we look have been pretty good partners with clinicaltrials.gov. About a year ago, we published about how many times it took our research teams to get acceptance by the clinicaltrials.gov group. And sometimes with delays of, you know, like 35 and 40 days, that's our experience. I think it's most universities experience. Um, we were a little disappointed when the response from clinicaltrials.gov was not that there's any problems with the website, but basically we don't know how to train our researchers to put the results in right. Um, so there's, there's cooperation, but there still is a little bit of tension between the research community and clinicaltrials.gov. So for us, I mean, we developed a, a system that is both a school of medicine, school of nursing, comprehensive cancer center. We brought in public health, Kennedy Trigger, and all children's. And um, Tony Keys, which you, who you see in the middle, has really been an extremely strong and effective leader for this group. Um, and does many uh, national presentations. If you, you know, I don't know what your position, but if you want somebody that can really give you the specifics on how to make this work, Tony is more than willing to talk to any, any university and, uh, about how to do it. Um, you have to work on the registration side, uh, you know, initial registration so that people put the right information in. The PRS reviewer comments, we make everybody so that any um, account associated with Johns Hopkins is open to Tony Keys and the staff. And we clearly recommend that no team enter any of the data without first consulting with our, our program staff. And that's true on the results reporting. So we begin sending the teams reminders about three to four months before the results are due. That uh, gives them the, the heads up. Now we're you know, working on our informatics solution to that, but right now it does involve a little bit of sort of manually looking at our EARB system and our clinical trials management system to say, okay, this is a study that was done and where Johns Hopkins is the sponsor. And we do have the ability if teams want to say, I don't want to do anything with this, which they really can't do. You always need the cooperation of the team. But we do have a few teams that say, this is way too complicated. I don't want to do it. I'll pay your staff to do it. Um, and uh, 
again, um, identifying resolving problem records, transferring records to and from the institution. Um, all of those are, you know, they're, they're rare, but they're expected, they're gonna happen, and you're gonna need experts to really help with that. And so we have a series of uh, uh, stages that we go in terms of getting the PI's attention. Um, and if you look at stage three, that's really where I come in um, as the vice dean of, uh, and basically start saying things like, you know, um, if you don't fix this record, you will not be able to submit another protocol to the IRB. Um, and it, it definitely, you know, helps get their attention. This is um, a little bit of the look at our situation. So if you, uh, if you look at results expected and results late, that we were only about 50% successful in July of uh, 2016. And with a lot of work, you can see by January 2018, we uh, were almost always on time. And since then, we've, we've actually hit 100% in terms of um, and meeting um, expectations. So a couple years ago, we did a survey of um, actually not just the CTSA institutions, but every organization that a sample of organizations that had um, were sponsors of a record in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and you can see, I think it's, it's changing now, but really at that time, less than half the organizations even had a clinical trials registration or results reporting policy that you could look to um, that, uh, and when they did, um, it's, the PIs were usually listed as responsible for doing all the reporting, only one organization reported uh, at one time penalizing a PI, and they, we didn't go into the details of how it is, but you do need some um, uh, you know, consequences of poor behavior, or I don't think we're going to you know, continue to get to the level of completion that we want. Uh, CTSA organizations report a mean of a 0 0.5 FTE in support of that. It may have gone up a little bit now um, to one, and I would say you know, the, probably two-thirds of the CTSA organizations have at least one person that is overseeing the clinical trials re registration reporting system at their site. I just want to try the clinical trial registration and results task force. Um, it is really a great group. Um, Tony's one of the co-leaders of it. You can see there's 221 institutions, 489 members um, that really uh, talks about how to make this program work. Um, and you can see for the most part, clinicaltrials.gov, the FDA, OHRP are frequently on the calls, are looking for this group to, um, to uh, you know, get feedback from, create solutions. Um, and I don't know, you know if there's anybody at your institution that is focused on this, but they could ask to join the, um, uh, this group and, and have the monthly um, webinars. So in summary, um, let me see. I would say um, that I do think registration reporting of clinical trial results should be supported by the clinical research uh, community. It should not just be a compliance requirement. It should be built into the fabric of how we think about science. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, maybe a, the question and answer, you know, with the, the whole COVID era, there's even more focus on clinicaltrials.gov right now and how you can understand things about this. Um, universities do have resource limitations in meeting these requirements, and I think we have to recognize that. I do think it's pretty, there are parts of it that are technical. I don't think every team is going to, research team is going to figure this out on their own, or certainly not in an efficient way. Um, I do think that we have to keep the pressure on clinicaltrials.gov to, uh, to improve the website. And we need to 
make sure that all of our opinions um, are known with that. I mean, even I have to say we're, you know, we, we probably are sometimes more part of the problem than the solution. There are software companies that have said, we'd be, we'd be very willing to do this with universities. Why don't all the universities get together and pay us 10 or $20,000 a year and you'll have a great IT solution. Um, but we have a hard time getting universities to act together uh, and, and, and manage new software. And it's not quite that simple because they usually, the, your home IT team still would have to do a lot of work in terms of interfacing with either the IRB system or your clinical trial management system or whatever you use to, to keep track of your clinical trials. And then finally, I don't think universities um, are gonna succeed unless they do have some dedicated staff. And I think if they, you know, this, this person or persons works with the, um, with the task force and some of the national resources, they could um, become very competent very quickly and deal with a lot of the, the problems. I didn't even you know, go through the ones that are vexing for research teams all the time. It started as a clinical trial. We couldn't do the enrollment. It, um, you know, it turned into an observational study and you know, those are the issues that make reporting very hard as well. You really need um, an, a, an expert that can help you take care of um, what are, you know, like I said, it's not the majority, but it's a significant minority. I mean, 30%, 40% of trials that are done in academic institutions, you know, have some change or have some, uh, some unusual aspects that uh, make it a little harder than you might think to just plug in the, the results. So um, with that, I'll be happy to take some questions or comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford. Um, I guess I'll just say first to Dr. Hodder, is there anything you'd like to add before or any questions you have before I go to our chat room? Uh, Dr. Ford, thank you very much. I'm Sally Hodder and I am the PI of our uh, Clinical and Translational Science Institute. And I want to thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation. It, it really was very, very helpful. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is we have, you know, initiated a clinical trial center of excellence with, you know, much more oversight over clinical trials. And as you mentioned, sort of the definition of a clinical trial is, is sometimes contentious. Um, but we have some departments that, you know, have students for purposes of their education doing clinical trials, and they really would meet the definition of a clinical trial, um, you know, with an intervention and a biomedical outcome. Yeah. What do you do in those cases? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you have them change it to a cohort study or? Well, you know, I mean, I, I guess it depends on what you want to do. Now, remember, if they're not funded, right, to some extent you have, um, I mean, I guess I would put it this way. If they're not using, you know, regulated drugs or they're not funded um, by, by the NIH or whatever, or um, that you, you might say, okay, we don't have to put them in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, but the issue would be, do you still want to do that because you think you know, this is the contribution to science and they should figure out how to do that. Um, and, you know, I think it, that is part of a policy. Now, at least for us, um, you know, we don't allow a trainee to be the PI of a protocol. So in essence, it resorts to the faculty member that is in charge of that protocol. Um, and in most cases, you know, we would um, we would require that they, um, you know, go through the process. Thank you. Yep. I, um, I think we probably have lots of questions. It was such a stimulating talk. Megan, do you want to emcee those? Sure. So our first question comes from Dr. Ali, Ali Karshenis. Um, and one of his questions he had would, how would clinical trials registrations suppress inappropriate or invalidated or poorly designed clinical trials. And his example would be the recent hydroxychloroquine studies um, in the journals or Lancet or New England Journal of Medicine. Yeah, 
Well, you know, I don't, I mean, it's interesting because you might see there's all sorts of, um, you know, looks at, uh, at, at, you know, reporting of results. The other, I mean, even the COVID trials, you realize you, and, and I think our group just published again about what's in clinicaltrials.gov, really. I mean, half the trials are from China. Very few have been reporting. On the other hand, they haven't really been a year since their trials over. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think in and of itself, um, well, certainly the, both the New England Journal and the Lancet one are, you know, observational studies where um, there's really still no controls over the quality and the registration of that. Um, you know, we have a proposal and several do as well, which is trying to encourage investigators to share protocols at the time of study design because of the, at least in the COVID, the increasing number of single site trials, which we can pretty much predict with certainty are not gonna meet their recruitment goal. So the issue, I mean, it is true, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and find them. We're encouraging them to reach out with a protocol. We actually are working now on calling what we call an Uber data safety monitoring board. Um, where you would have for the, and it's particularly for the hydroxychloroquine, where, you know, each of those data safety monitoring boards is meeting in isolation. And in reality, um, we believe that were they meeting now and sharing protocols and sharing data, they could actually take advantage of all the information that's being collected on hydroxychloroquine and not just um, what's done in a specific study. So um, look, the reality is if people do not finish up reporting on the COVID clinical trials, it's gonna be a really, it's gonna be a black eye for science. And I think you're gonna see all the groups that have some stake in requiring clinicaltrials.gov um, uh, results, uh, you know, registration results, they're just going to have even more ammunition to, um, to increase the penalties. And, and that is part of what, you know, Francis Collins and the NIH is rethinking about um, using the COVID as an opportunity to, um, to bring attention to uh, the need for improvements in the reporting. Thank you. Um, so if there's other questions, um, please raise your hand in the chat or type it in. Um, and I've promoted Dr. Karshainas to be able to ask any follow-up questions as well. Thank you so much. That was, that was great. Uh, I'm very happy with the response. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Karshainas, I think you had a second question while I- Oh, sorry. Was yeah, it? absolutely. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I guess my uh, second question was, how much of the clinicaltrial.gov data do you feel is being shared with either government-sponsored uh, data warehouses like Procornet or some other commercial data consortiums like Orion's and, you know, TrinetX and so forth and so on? Yeah, I mean, you know, right now, uh, you know, they don't. And I think that's a bit of a problem. You know, you, you have, I mean, it's kind of interesting to see when um, like vendors that come from another industry look at the clinical trials, um, uh, you know, process. And they just can't understand why there isn't more standardization of the clinical trial a description and reporting process. And they'll say things like, I don't get it. You know, use one format for the NIH application, use another format for getting your IND for the FDA, you need another format for publication, you need another format for clinicaltrials.gov, and then maybe somebody is going to merge the data somewhere in the background. And I think that, 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 you know, the hope is that there will be some standardization of the of the fields that would allow. Now remember, clinicaltrials.gov is, is just the group results. It's not the individual data, uh, at, the, at, at the individual level data. Um, so, um, you know, I do think one way or another, we've got to make it easier 
for research teams to meet all of their obligations and make it easier for groups to, um, you know, to, to be able to access the data. And that's why, you know, to tell you the truth, like this vividly, you may take a look at it. I mean, I kind of like it. They, they, um, um, in terms of the individual level data sharing, and they are accepted as an NIH data share. You have a very good way to, to find data. Remember, you could go in an environment and do, and combine six trials, you know, looking at, uh, you, know, you know, ARBs and cancer or something like that, right? So that, that, um, that is a benefit as well. They do have a contract with a company that gives a real discount rate, which is um, trying to anonymize the clinical trial individual data, which, you know, is again, a, a very tough area. If you anonymize the data too much, it's useless. Um, but there are probably some basic things we could do that would, you know, protect the, the identities of patients in clinical trials. And I have to say, obviously, from the IRB perspective, we do not, in the consent form, tell people that they will be, um, you know, that their individual level data might be placed on a website for sharing and what the risk of re-identification would be. Because, you know, clinical trials, it's impossible to de-identify a lot of these, if, if someone is looking for three odd side effects out of a, out of a study of a couple hundred, you, it's not that hard to figure it out once you look at the individual level. So you're very dependent on the, you know, on the, the integrity of the researchers that are using that data. And, and Dr. Ford, uh, my last question, again, I, I really enjoyed your presentation thoroughly. Uh, my last question is, uh, for those clinical trials that have a DSMB, the Data Safety Monitoring Board, sitting outside of the clinical trial, what would be the trade-off if uh, you're not able to report on the final completion of the data simply because the DSMB may not be done with its due diligence? <laughs> well, you know, that, that is... Um... Right. I mean, that theoretically is not really allowed. They're going to say the data safety monitoring board. I mean, they shouldn't be doing the full analysis, but yeah, they, they could, you know, they could hold up or have some additional questions. But, you know, in general, the DSMB should be more focused on the, the ongoing safety of the trial and not necessarily in, in the business of delaying the reporting of the results. But, but there are situations where that, that can come up and um, sometimes, you know, the clinicaltrials.gov will understand an excuse like that and sometimes they won't. Thank you so much. Well, I know we're a couple minutes over the three o'clock deadline, but we are so grateful for your presentation, Dr. Ford. Um, and, um, oh wait, there's one more, do we have time for one more question, Dr. Ford? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, most results of any study have many versions. Even a later version submitted to a journal may require additional changes, which may differ results from originally submitted to clinicaltrials.gov. Can we merely submit a note in clinicaltrials.gov that the full results have been published in X journal? Well, what you should do, you know, this is a discussion that we've had and even clinicaltrials.gov isn't exactly sure about it, is, you know, when you do a secondary data analysis, do you refer to the parent trial or do you start a second one? Um, and, you know, there are pros and cons to each of those. Um, certainly, if you do a secondary data analysis, you should make sure that you refer back to the main analyses with the clinicaltrials.gov, because the concern is if we're not clear enough about that, then people do meta-analyses and they will assume they're two different studies. So, you know, those 200 people in a clinical trial might be counted twice. So it is, um, you know, that it, it, that's been brought up multiple times about what do you do with secondary data analyses, ancillary studies. Um, and I, you know, I don't think there's any one approach about whether you try to modify the original clinicaltrials.gov or start a second one. But what everyone agrees on is you have to reference the primary 
data analysis and the primary clinical trials.gov record. Thank you. So I appreciate your time and I appreciate everybody joining. We had over 60 attendees today. Um, so good. Thank you so much. And all right. Well, good luck. And, and again, at the end of the presentation, you'll see a lot of you know tips and different websites that you might go to, or if you have specific questions, um, you know, we have people that would be willing to help. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks.